So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third lecture of the cycle of conferences unearthing Japanese archaeology, rediscovering ancient Japan through contemporary studies. Thank you very much again to be here also for today's conference. Um, well, probably you already know myself, but this is the third conference, but I'm Claudia Zancan, I'm a PhD student here at Kafoskari University of Venice in uh, Japanese art and archaeology, and my main field of research are decorative tombs in Kyushan Island. Um, we organize with Geshin Association and with the collaboration of Professor Silvia Vesco this cycle of conferences to try to um, get closer also Italian scholars, Italian community to Japanese archaeology. So information, the next conference will be provided soon on our social channels and will be next Monday. This, this time will be on the morning, so it will be 10.30 and our guest will be Professor Maria Shinoto, who is going to have a conference on decorative coffin in Kyushin Island. So um, today is a really great honor to have as a speaker, Professor Mark, Mark Hudson. Uh, I will just give you some brief information about our guest. Uh, Mark Hudson is an archeologist inter interdisciplinary Eurasia Triangles Research Group, where he works on integrating archeological data with historical linguistics and ancient DNA to understand population movements in Neolithic and Bronze Age Northeast Asia. Is also interested in archaeology of ancient globalization, food religions, and violence. Mark Hudson was educated at SOAS, Cambridge, and Australian National University. He taught archaeology and anthropology at Okayama, Tsukuba, and West Kyushu University from 1996 to 2015. Um, from 2016 to 2017, he was professor at the Montefuji World Heritage Center. Shizuoka, where he helped design the prize-winning exhibits on Mount Fuji. He was conducted archaeological field work in Japan, Israel, Syria, and UK and Slovenia. And now he's the research associate of Institute of the Desia Oriental, ENS de Lyon, and currently co-supervisor PhD students. So um, at the end of the presentation, it will be possible to ask questions. And as you know, you can also write them in chat as you prefer, and we'll be reading them after the presentation. And now I'll leave the floor to our guests, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Geshim organization for this wonderful invitation. Um, can everybody hear me okay in the room? Yeah. So, um, um, so yes, so I'm going to talk today about uh, food in Japan from an archaeological perspective. Um, a lot of the talk is sort of work in progress at the moment. So sometimes the conclusions are um, not quite finalized, but um, nevertheless, it um, should give you an idea of some of the work that's possible um, on food related topics from an archeological perspective. So yeah, so I, the title, yeah, Sushi. So, um, now, today, of course, sushi has become an amazing globalized food, um, second to perhaps Italian food. Anywhere you go in the world now, there's sushi. Um, even where I work in Jena, small town in East Germany, the old East Germany, a long way from the sea, there's about 10 different um, sushi restaurants. Well, not just sushi, but Asian restaurants that also have sushi. And well, this wasn't the case when I was a student, um, but the last 10 years, it's really taken off in a big way. But um, this history of, well, sushi is a sort of iconic Japanese food. But if you look closely at the history, um, it's really a bit more complicated. And it's something of that um, topic that I want to talk about today. Okay. So a lot of people have a very stereotypical view of food, farming in Japan, 
and often it includes um, things like this. So um, the idea that Japanese food and farming are sort of very traditional and um, quite natural um, part of Japanese culture, inherent to Japanese culture, if you like. And also that they're very sort of unique, particular to Japan. And Japanese food only became globalized after the 19th century in the Meiji period. And also pretty common is this idea that Japanese food is somehow very sustainable. It's connected to Japanese nature. Um, so the farming system in Japan is seen as sort of an old, timeless, um, system. Um, um, and one reason for this was um, in the 1920s, when the first um, Yayoi period farming tools were discovered, they looked like this, and um, they were first discovered in the Nara Basin. And at that time, people were using basically the same design of tools. So people said, ah, um, nothing very much has changed, and um, the Yayoi period was the beginning of this traditional um, agricultural um, practice. Um, and interestingly, as Japanese food has become very globalized, the Japanese government has decided to uh, sort of invent or create this washoku designation, which was recognized by UNESCO, I think, in 2013, um, and um, promoted by the um, previous, the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who has this little video um, you can see online. It's been viewed quite a few times. Um, and so the idea that, you know, Japanese, the actual, if you go to Japan, the actual food that you eat is um, quite a mixture of different things, right? Um, but people will say that that's um, only really happened since the 19th century. Um, so the diversity of Japanese food is sort of conflated with westernization. So in a way, the, well, there are various ways of thinking about this, but one useful way is uh, James Scott, one of my favorite writers, who has a book, um, Seeing Like a State. And the typical stereotypical views of Japanese food are very much seeing food like a state. So it's um, seeing food like the taxman, if you like. And Scott uses this word legible. So uh, the extent to which food is legible to the taxman. Um, and um, this is, um, so that's one approach, but it's, and in the Japanese case, it's basically seeing food like a Confucian state. So it has this um, mystic, um, yes, I'm not sure if someone talking um, in the background. Yeah. Um, and um, so it has this sort of moralistic Confucian um, sort of ideology behind it. But at the same time, there are several differences. Um, one, which I'll talk about later, is fishing. And fishing is not very, uh, it's not really a Confucian thing at all. Um, and also um, something which I don't really have time to talk about, but I could maybe touch on it in the questions is the Japanese really emphasize the Southern Chinese or Southeast Asian aspect of subsistence. Um, so, um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so of course all food is social, people eat food together, um, so we can talk about seeing food like a state, but another common Japanese perspective is seeing food like a village, so the idea that, um, well, particularly rice is produced in a village, everyone has to cooperate together, work together to do that. And um, this idea is really strong. There's been recently, there's been a lot of work in psychology arguing that rice farmers uh, are very cooperative 
And um, whereas wheat farmers are very individualistic. And um, it sounds a bit dodgy, right? but they've been, the last 10 years have been several big papers on this in um, journals like Science. Um, and um, there've been studies, for example, uh, there was one study in China looking at Starbucks, you know, the coffee shop Starbucks, which probably quite rightly doesn't exist in Venice, but um, they compared Starbucks in Southern China and Northern China. And they found that if um, people put chairs in the sort of middle of the room uh, in uh, Southern China, people would be very cooperative and move them apart. But in the North, they wouldn't do that. And the explanation was that this is due to the difference between rice farming and wheat farming, which in my view is, is wrong, but okay. Um, and when I was working in Japan, we had a sort of field school in Iwate Prefecture, um, a little red prefecture up there. So it's a mountain village, a um, little bit similar to um, the South Tyrol where I was this weekend. Um, and in fact, they um, they keep cows and they take cows in the summer up to this mountain pasture and then bring them back in the winter. Um, they also grow um, this, the bottom right photo is um, harvesting buckwheat. Um, so rice is not a big thing here. And there was only one family in this village that in the 1970s, suddenly decided to grow rice. And the father said, oh, Japan, 1970s, it's uh, too shameful if we don't grow our own rice. So they decided, um, I mean, this must be, I'm gonna be, later I'm gonna talk about the late spread of rice to Japan, but this must be the last, one of the last places anywhere in Japan that you know, actually decided to grow rice. And they, um, it was not easy, they eventually succeeded, but in, in a very small area, which you can see in the photo. Um, but this village is quite interesting for several reasons. Um, one is that they still eat things like acorns, very traditional foods. Um, and another thing is of interest, my colleague at the time, Professor Nishida said, this village is interesting because there's no headman. Anywhere else in Japan, there's a guy who's a sort of boss and he tells people, um, you can take water this week, you can take water next week. Uh, but in this village, everyone is sort of not individual, but they're based on the household. Um, and they, within their own household, they do what they like. And this is well, it's interesting, I suppose, for psychology, but it's also interesting in terms of risk. So um, how farmers manage risk. If something goes wrong, what do you do? And a lot of um, risk management in um, pre modern societies is in fact at the, at the household level. So to some extent, you know, the state can say, okay, oh, those peasants are starving, we should give them some rice, but you can't really rely on that all the time. So um, in a lot of cases all over the world, um, people, um, um, you know, collect wild foods um, at the household level. Okay, so um, yeah, and another, just getting a bit more concrete, um, four more quite specific claims of Japanese exceptionalism, if you like. So how Japanese farming is connected to Japanese culture, which is in some way special. And um, number one is that Japanese farming arrived late. And you might think this is something that's a bit well, embarrassing, if you like. Um, but um, people, some people sort of turn this around and say, well, Japanese farming arrived late in Japan. But for that reason, 
um, farming in Japan has not really destroyed the environment like in Europe or other places. The second point is that um, people in Japan just use the plains, the flat areas to grow rice, so um, they didn't use the mountains. And the mountains were, um, the forests were still remaining on the mountains. Um, the th third point that um, fishing replaced animal husbandry. Um, and then the fourth idea that um, traditional sort of mentalities or religion supported um, sustainability and, and wise use of resources. Um, Last year, we published a paper where we looked at these four um, ideas and we found that there's very little evidence for any of them. But at the same time, we found or suggested quite a few areas of further research. And um, a lot of this involves archaeology because in a lot of cases, um, the archaeological evidence to discuss these topics um, is quite weak. So, um, so the, what I'm sort of talking about today is in a way coming out of this paper and saying, okay, these are the things we'd like to know and starting to look in more detail at various um, topics within this. And yeah, this is the last slide on these sort of stereotypes of Japan. But um, so, um it's 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 okay to think about these stereotypes but how do they come together and this is a paper we have in review which um one of the figures argues that this is a, a sort of common way that the people in japan have tried to understand um the economy pre-modern economy so they say that um japan was isolated was isolated. Um, so that meant that people worked together, um, what you might call ultra sociality. Now, all humans are very ultra social. So all humans cooperate very closely. It's really very unusual in the animal kingdom for that to happen. But people in Japan say that um, the Japanese are ultra, ultra so social. social. And that means that um, they have to work very hard together. And this means that they are self-sufficient and they're not affluent, but they have just enough affluence. There's a book in English about this called, um, just well, it develops this idea of just enough affluence. So, okay, so, um, <laughs> it works again, yeah. so today I'm gonna, um, try to suggest a quite different approach to agriculture or the pre-modern economy in Japan. And I'm going to propose three points. One, that agriculture was very late. Um, two, that it was very globalized from the beginning. And three, that it had a big commercial side. Everybody, you just clicking, oh, yeah. just clicking up. Okay. Um, so first, farming as a late arrival. Um, so we know that in Europe, for example, um, farming spread from the Middle East quite early. And as you can see from this map, it was quite a complicated process, but it spread sort of little by little. Um, and by the time it reached um, Britain, about 4,000 BC, um, it had taken thousands of years, but it was a sort of ongoing process. Well, um, and of course there were quite big changes in emphasis, different crops, different emphasis in this process. But um, in Japan, the, the process was a little bit different. Well, quite different, I think. And um, a couple of years ago, I published this essay, this chapter called slouching towards the Neolithic. So the progress was a rather slow. Now, um, in Northeast Asia, the first type of farming that spread was in fact millet farming. 
And um, in the fourth millennium BC, this um, spread from um, the Liao, Liao River Basin um, in, in this area here um, to Korea and then to the Russian Far East. Um, but it didn't then move to Japan until much later, um, sometime well after 1000 BC. And when it did spread to Japan, it was not just millet, it was also rice, it was also barley, wheat, uh, and some animals, which I'll talk about later. So, um, but at the same time, um, the Jomon culture, which um, probably this name Jomon means something to most of you, I guess, Jomon, not necessarily. Okay, so the, um, the culture in the Japanese islands from around 14,000 BC was called Jomon, and um, it had several of the sort of hallmarks of the Neolithic as imagined by Gordon Child in the top right there. Um, so it had pottery, uh, it had polished stone tools, um, it had sedentism, um, but it didn't really have full-scale farming, which was seemed to be a difference um, with Europe. But recently, in fact, we found that um, in the German period, they were cultivating some plants like soybeans, um, azuki bean, um, this um, sometimes called a beefsteak plant. Um, Perilla is the Latin name. And um, if, you have, uh, if you have sushi or sashimi, it's often a green leaf that's um, served underneath this. So they were, they, they were cultivating some plants they knew about cultivation, but they didn't um, accept cereals from, from the mainland. So there was this sort of millet, um, <coughs> sorry, um, agriculture front and a rice agriculture front in, in the south, uh, um, which existed for several thousand years. Um, and didn't cross to Japan. Um, now, this was, you might think, oh, this was because Japan is isolated and was not in contact with the con continent. But in fact, that's not true. There was um, quite a lot of contact with, um, between Kyushu particularly and Korea at this time. And um, I wasn't able to Listen to the last talk by Ilona Bausch, but maybe she talked about this topic, this sort of, and she's written about this quite a lot. Um, so Japan was certainly not isolated. Now, um, farming reached Kyushu around 1000 BC, but after that, another interesting delay, it took another 2000 years to reach the south of uh, Okinawa the Yayama Islands. Um, and um, this illustration is, is a radiocarbon dated cereal remains um, with some fancy statistical um, analysis, but you can see that um, it took, it was quite a gradual spread um, down into Okinawa. And again, this was not because Okinawa was isolated. And in fact, there was this trade in shells um, between Okinawa and Kyushu. So they were in touch. And um, yeah, so last, last year we published a paper looking at the spread of farming to the Ryukyu Islands in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and um, it's really, I mean, it's sort of difficult to explain why it was so slow and then why it suddenly happened at the time that it did. And we 
while in the paper we talked about um, so there's a demographic element population was increasing um, but maybe not so much um, there was also a lot of sort of trade and piracy going on um, and then there was to some extent the expansion of state power uh, and it seems to be a sort of combination of these of these three things um, so yeah so farming reaches um, southern Okinawa, just above Taiwan, in the 12th century AD, which is exactly the time when it, farming reaches Hawaii, when farming reaches uh, Easter Island and New Zealand. And this um, farming culture in Polynesia basically originated in Taiwan, which is next to Okinawa. Um, so um, people from Taiwan went all over this, all over the Pacific. Um, again, they changed their subsistence quite a lot, but um, they didn't go north to, or if they did go to Okinawa, they didn't spread farming. So really quite mysterious um, processes uh, at work. Um, okay, and then the second point, um, globalization. Um, now, this term globalization has become quite common in popular in archaeology recently. Um, and um, some people like it, some people don't. But it's the idea that there was a lot of contact going on, um, particularly in the Bronze Age, when, um, you know, wheat and barley spread from Western Eurasia to the East. Um, the millets and rice were starting to spread from East Asia across to Europe. Um, and um, so there's a lot of exchange of foods going on. And um, the late spread of farming to Japan can, I think, be understood um, in this as part of this sort of globalized package, if you like. So when Right, um, farming took a long time to reach Japan, but when it did, it was this whole package of very globalized um, crops and animals. Um, yeah, so this just um, some of the recent publications on this topic recently. Um, and um, yeah. So yeah, so one thing was that arrived in Japan in the Bronze Age, the Aoi period, was um, carp ag aquaculture. So people would raise freshwater carp in paddy fields. Um, in China, this goes back quite a long time, but um, it seems to have only spread to uh, Japan after about 1000 BC. Um, another um, thing or animal um, that arrived in the Yayoi was the chicken. Now, this has also become a very sort of big area of archaeological research at the moment. There's been just even the last one year, there's been quite a few big papers on this topic. Um, and the, yeah, this is a map from the PNAS paper by Peters et al. And um, it shows you how the chicken spread from Southeast Asia um, across Eurasia. And well, in the middle in Central Asia, we don't have so much data, but you can see that it reached Japan around um, 2000. Uh, these are these dates BP, so years ago. Um, and in fact, it reached sort of Europe around more or less around the same time. I'm just pressing go to it? Um, so, yeah. So it was, if you like, a, a, a globalized spread. It was spreading through, probably through the same sort of process. We don't know what the process was necessarily, but these dates seem to suggest that something the same sort of you know thing was happening 
um, and of course it was spread by, by humans. Um, now in the Yayoi period itself, there are chickens, but not very many. And none of them are radiocarbon dated, which is um, a little bit, um, yeah, not so secure, but there are also a few of these sort of um, pottery terracotta um, images of, of chickens. Well, what we think are chickens, and um, like this one, this one here, um, which okay, maybe some people have different ideas, but um, generally they are accepted as chickens. This the drawing on the, the right is from the early Kofun period, but it's also um, interpreted as a chicken. And there are more than um, 50 Haniwa chickens known. Um, but, so, but generally in Japan, it seems that chickens were used for ritual, um, like sort of you know, alarm clock type of thing. Uh, also for cock fighting, which is mentioned in, in Nihon Shoki. Um, so that sort of precedes, um, yeah, omelettes and you know, eating roast chicken. But that's not unusual in many places in the world. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, that is a sort of a common pattern. <clears throat> um, so I, yeah, I started to collect data on um, chickens from Japan. I, Hoped I would finish before this talk, but no, sorry, couldn't do it. But um, and the, the data is um, difficult to interpret, but uh, it seems that there was a big increase around the 17th century. Um, and um, my sort of working hypothesis is that this is well somehow connected to Europeans coming to Japan. And um, we know, for example, that um, the Portuguese um, started these foods like tempera and castella cake and various other things, which needed eggs. And um, tempera was served to the emperor of Japan in as early as 1613. Um, so um, it um, became, you know, a common uh, food. And um, there's a book by Luke Roberts, a historian on the Posa domain in, in Shikoku. And um, he writes that um, after 1820, so a little bit late, um, over 6 million eggs were exported from Tosa to Osaka. And calculations are a bit dif difficult, but this could mean you know, six, million, uh, 6 million eggs uh, could mean something like 60,000 hens to produce all these eggs, um, which is quite a lot. Um, so things were changing at that time. Um, in the um, sort of aristocratic feasts, um, wild birds were very common at this time. And the Jesuits like Rodriguez say that, you know, the Japanese, they liked brain, swan, and duck. Um, and these pictures show, well, preparing a feast with birds, wild birds, and also this guy who's actually selling in a market and selling wild, wild birds. Um, but, you know, this could be, in a way, connected um, because um, the aristocrats are always trying to eat something a little bit special, right? Um, so if, every, if everyone else is eating chickens, they might say, oh, um, we're going to eat something unusual, which is crane or swan. And the same sort of process you can see happening in Europe. Uh, where these wild birds um, are very much associated with aristocratic diets and, and feasting. So again, this is something I'm sort of working on at the moment. 
um, forces. Um, they arrive quite late in Japan, um, late fourth century, mainly fifth century. Um, but what is interesting here is that they arrive quite quickly after stirrups and saddles were invented. And um, we have a, a paper um, in press, which sort of like the, the oldest syrup and saddle um, from Mongolia uh, around the fourth century AD, um, the oldest one so far found. Um, so around that time, it seems that this military use of horses. So if you have a saddle and stirrups, you can you can sit on the horse and you know, fire arrows and, and it's much more stable. And this sort of military um, use of horses spread really, really quickly. And of course, came to Europe as well uh, within a few centuries. So this is, it's late, but it's, it's globalized, if you like. And um, yeah, I don't probably have so much time to talk about this, but um, this table is the number of horses in villages around Mount Fuji um, before and after the eruption of Mount Fuji in 1707, the Hoei eruption. And um, you can see that um, certainly before the eruption, there were quite a lot of horses and households um, were um, keeping um, quite substantial numbers of horses um, at this time. Yeah, and then, okay, the next thing, um, some work we've been doing on, on prunus fruits, so peach, apricot, and so forth. And this um, is an animation, and the, the time shown at the top is from years BC going to, to AD, and it shows this is directly dated um, peach seeds peach stones from Japan. So they start um, around 400 BC um, and then become quite common, particularly in Western Japan. Um, and um, yeah, this is the paper that we have, well, it's in review at the moment, it hasn't been accepted yet. Um, but one thing that was really interesting in looking at this data was how many finds there are from Japan. And in fact, everywhere else we used everything that was available. In Japan, we just used radio, directly radiocarbon dated peaches because there were so many and it would be unbalanced. Um, and I think, you know, in Europe, the biggest find of peaches was from a medieval monastery in Fulda uh, in um, well, it's near to Yena. Uh, but in Japan, Nakimuku site in Nara has something like, and, and this site, sorry, has 45 peach stones in Fulda. Nakimuku site, they're pits with over 3,000 peach stones. So it's um, very large numbers. Um, so the Yayoi people, they liked peaches. Um, and why was that? And one thing that I think might be relevant here is this idea um, suggested by Gina Barnes, who is uh, in the audience, online audience, that the um, ideology, the Taoist ideology of the Queen Mother of the West was linked with the early Hufun burial system. Um, and um, this Taoist Queen Mother has which is linked in Chinese mythology with various ideas um, which are listed here. But I think, uh, but one thing in, in China is also this idea of, of peaches. So it appears in the text, these are immortal, so-called immortal peaches that are, um, if I remember correctly, they only become ripe every 100 years. And if you eat them, you can live a long time. So I think that, you know, this, um, 
Yayoi, later, later Yayoi interest in Peters could be associated with these um, Taoist ideas. And it's probably one more piece of evidence to add to in support of, of Gina's um, hypothesis. Okay, and then the final sort of section on commercialization. Um, and um, we know from the Chinese history, uh, the history of the Wei dynasty, that there were already grain markets in the third century AD. Um, and this, for example, on Iki Island and Tsushima Islands, I think mentioned in the first talk in, in this series, um, the text says these islands, it's, they don't have good rice fields, so they have to go to markets to buy grain. And then another quite interesting um, piece of information is from the eighth century, um, in the uh, which says that you know if official government cattle and horses, if they die somewhere else, then um, people have to um, use their you know, skin and meat, but um, but they have to be sold sold at the nearest market. So that means that there were already markets. Um, to buy and sell these animal products. And probably it didn't happen every day that you know, a government horse would walk through the town and suddenly die. It was probably unusual. But they were buying and selling these products in a sort of, well, maybe not every day, but it was, it was common. Um, and um, yes, and then one sort of, Another project we're currently also working on is wheat um, and the Japanese state um, issued several decrees um, encouraging peasants to cultivate other crops, not just rice. Um, so millets and wheat was also included in these um, decrees. Um, and wheat in fact had several advantages um, because it could be uh, grown over the winter. So rice, normally you plant it in the spring, harvest in the autumn. But after the rice harvest, you can plant wheat or barley and then um, harvest it before the rice. And um, rice was, uh, sorry, wheat was usually not taxed at this time. So it could be sold as a commercial crop um, and in the paper that we're working on, we're sort of looking at the um, trade in food to the Philippines during the well, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, so when the Spanish um, occupied, well, mainly Manila at first, um, they imported a lot of food from China, but also from Japan. Um, so wheat flour, but also fish and ham, things like that. Um, and um, so there are quite a few texts about this. Um, and um, yeah, some, well, several Italian Jesuits, in fact, were writing about this. Um, and you may know this by, by heart, all this text, but um, yeah, two or three Japanese ships sailing to the Philippines, exporting biscuits. This probably, this means I, I think like ships, biscuits for sailors, um, may presumably wheat, um, and then wheat flour, beef, um, and then um, many other things, the Florentine Carliti. Um, so the Japanese, they have wheat, they don't make bread, um, but they, um, they, sell it to the Philippines and other places. Um, and this makes big profits, between 60 and 100% profit, which is quite a lot. <laughs> and there's an interesting um, letter by Kiyomasu Kato, who was, um, a, a, well, he was a general in the Japanese invasion of Korea. And um, things, were not going so well in for the Japanese army in Korea, and they needed money to buy guns 
Um, so he wrote to his back to Kyushu and says uh, in this letter that, um, ah, I hear that if we sell wheat flour, it makes big profits. So I instruct you to um, make wheat flour and get a ship and, and sell it. Now, he doesn't say exactly in this letter where it was supposed to be sent to, but, well, several historians argue that um, Manila was the most probable um, location for this. Um, and yeah, I mean, Japanese historians often argue that um, wheat was, there was, there was no market in Japan, so they had to, um, you know, exchange it overseas. But you can think about it in the opposite way. Um, because Japan had these markets, then it was possible to sell things. And that's the way markets work. It's, um, the market exists and this year you can sell red water bottles. Next year it can be green water bottles, but um, the money and the, pro the products go to the market. Um, and um, there's also, yeah, another interesting um, text is that in already in the eighth to ninth century, the government was um, prohibiting premature harvesting of barley and wheat. And this was because there was already a big market for unripe um, wheat to be used for, for horses. So this is also quite interesting. Um, yeah, and then finally uh, on fishing, um, it's okay, time wise, if I continue a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay, right. Um, so, yeah, so just briefly on fishing. Um, so the, like the traditional question was people say, oh, the Japanese, they didn't eat animals, they ate fish instead. But the real question was, is um, how commercial was fishing? Because, okay, you can catch fish near the coast, but to move it inland around anything above 50 kilometers, you have to preserve it. So um, it has to be like a commercial system. It's not just one family catching fish. It has to be like a bigger market system. Um, and okay, I just, yeah, I just move over this. Um, so, so yeah, so some sort of preservation can be salt. Um, it can be fermentation, can be drying fish. Um, but to really, if it's, you know, people inland, if they're eating a lot of fish, then it has to be quite a big operation. Um, and we know in later periods, um, a lot of this sort of, um, these commodities um, from the sea were um, well, very popular, but they took a lot of processing like abalone and like garam, of course, bonito, shark fins. Um, and it's, it's often difficult to work out the history of these of these products. Um, and um, yeah, they can be well big profits, but time and labor intensive. And this um, people who know Japan will know this katsuobushi. But Japanese, did you know that Japanese katsuobushi is banned in the EU because it contains um, something that gives you cancer? So there was a guy. Japanese guy said, who came to Europe and spent years trying to make katsuobushi with a new me method. And eventually he succeeded in Spain. So if you buy katsuobushi in Europe, it comes in fact from Spain. So a bit of a trivial, <laughs> trivia point, but okay, see cucumber, I'll just pass over that. Um, and this is too much detail now, but this is a, public, a paper I published last year, I think, on different stages in fishing in Japan. Um, and um, so in a way, it's a sort of heuristic model. So we need more archeological research to, to prove, you know, disprove these stages, but um, it's a start. And 
Um, yeah, so finally, there's a four slides in conclusion, um, late globalized commercial. Um, this is a book we have, uh, will be published quite soon. And um, so there's a question of you know, globalization, but you know, if you have rice in Japan, why do you need wheat? Why do you need millet? Or if you have one starch, then that's enough. And in, in Italy, for example, in the Roman period, they had wheat and that was the main um, starch. And in this book, there's a paper by um, Claudio Belloni who, uh, from Padua, who on rice uh, in Italy, um, which was known from the Roman period, but it was only much later, in, maybe in the 16th century, that it really became popular. Um, and this is different to Japan because Japan already had this sort of package of many cereals, which made it quite resilient in, in ecological terms. And then the second point, um, animals, very difficult to evaluate because the, the ecological record is very poor. Um, um, and the state was both promoting animal usage, but also limiting animal usage. There's a whole you know, debate about these discrimination against people who worked with animals in Japan. Some of you may know about that. But this is also sort of enabled, if you like, by a huge in, um, well, commercial imports of deer skins um, from Taiwan, Southeast Asia. Um, so it was difficult to produce them in, in Japan itself, so they were importing them. And Europeans often did the same. Um, so that's something that needs more research as well. Um, fishing, very difficult to evaluate. Um, there's, hard, there's, in my view, there's no hard evidence that medieval Japanese were eating more fish than in Europe, where we know that because of these Christian fasting limits, um, regulations, then people were eating a lot of fish and was dried fish from the Atlantic, which became very, particularly in Northern Europe, um, after around 1000 AD. And this, well, we're working on this using iso isotope analysis. And a couple of years ago, we published an isotope database, which we hope to use to, to look um, at this um, a bit more. So yeah, so um, sushi as a typical Japanese food, well, yes, but it's quite late. It really, sushi itself, really develops in Edo period. It was a very commercial, a fast food. Uh, now it's become um, very global and um, particularly um, salmon sushi, which you may know um, was um, introduced by Norwegian um, salmon farmers who wanted to sell salmon uh, to Japan and they succeeded very much. Um, okay, and that's, that's all, but I just, Finally, just a big thank you to my the work. The presentation today involved a lot involves a lot of work with uh, various colleagues, some of whom I, I showed here. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>